Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's class. Hope you had a good weekend. Uh, looking forward to uh, a great week ahead. Uh, let's pray and let's get started. I would like to request uh, one of you to please lead in prayer. Anybody? Uh, Dev, uh, would you be able to lead? Sure, ma'am. Yeah. Father, we thank you once again for this wonderful week that you have given us, Lord. We thank you that we've got this uh, opportunity to come together and learn. We start from, from the books of the Bible, Lord God. As we go through it, Lord Jesus, I pray that you will uh, touch each one of us, Lord Jesus, to comprehend everything that we are, we are supposed to know, Lord God. As we learn it, Lord Jesus, help each one of us to be able to use it for your kingdom, Lord God. Help our men and help those who are who haven't yet joined this journey in time as well. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Dev. So we have started uh, studying from the book of First Peter in the last class, and that's what we are going to continue with today. Hebrews is completed. And this week, uh, I will be posting an assignment for all of us. So have a, uh, you know, keep an eye on your Google Classroom. And those of you who are connecting via e-learning platform, you, know, you can just uh, uh, make a note of the assignment. and yeah do it in time and submit it that would be your second assignment and then there will be a last assignment which will come up you know a little uh, later towards the end of the course so uh coming back to first peter over here i gave a brief introduction in the last class and uh, i shared that as uh peter introduces himself this epistle was written by peter and uh, peter is quite clear about his calling you know you see him addressing himself as an apostle of jesus christ so um, that is about the authorship of this letter we also see that uh, this letter was written roughly around the same time uh, as uh, that of the book of hebrews um, and uh, during that time you know there was persecution which was quite prevalent in the uh, uh, in in the regions uh, so uh, around 67 to 69 ad you know, that's the timing when this book was written it was written as an encouragement so you have um, you know words of uh, uh, hope that, that Peter includes here, he helps the believers understand, you know, what kind of a hope God has given them so uh, that they should not fix their mind on the earthly problems. Instead, they must value the, the kingdom realities, you know, that um, uh, their, their spirit man can understand. So that's what he's calling these believers to. And uh, in the last class, I said that it was written to the Jews and Gentiles. But then, you know, primarily, as I um, just uh, studied further, I uh, uh, noticed that it was written to the Gentiles. Okay, So it was written to the Gentiles. And many of the re regions that are mentioned in um, First Peter, some of the places that he includes, uh, right in chapter one, they are all Gentile regions. So the audience is uh, Gentile, but of course, you know the Jews also can learn from it. Uh, so the audience is Gentiles. Okay, so let's uh, just settle that without any confusion. And um, the audience is from uh, Asia Minor. So it was earlier called as Asia Minor, the region, but then, you know, you will read uh, certain names of places uh, with, uh, which later on, you know, they had, they had newer names, but that region is known as Asia Minor. Okay, so that is uh, a little bit about the book um, and about Peter, you know, there is a lot that is uh, known to us in the word of God. We see that uh, Peter was a notable disciple of Jesus, he 
by personality was the one who uh, spoke before he thought you know that kind of an attitude he carried he um, wanted to step out he had that courage to always step out uh, and do something for god you see that he had the courage to uh, even rebuke jesus when jesus said that i that he is going to die on the cross you find peter saying no jesus you know don't say that so he was the only one among the disciples who had that kind of an attitude and courage even to tell jesus what to do so that is peter's personality uh, jesus also uh, rebuked peter uh, when you know peter said that okay jesus you are not going to die this uh, uh, difficult death then you know get thee behind me satan jesus rebuked it was uh, uh the influence of the enemy right so though peter spoke jesus recognized that it's the influence of satan and that is why jesus also rebuked uh, uh peter so we see that so a little more about peter would be that uh, uh very unfortunately he denied jesus he told jesus that he is going to uh stand for him and face any difficulty for jesus but uh you know three times he actually denied jesus and it was a very uh, you could say it was a low in his faith walk with the lord uh, but later on when the lord jesus ascended up into heaven the birth of the new church or the early church took place on the day of pentecost and over there you see peter emerging as one of the uh, uh, notable apostles so there are many apostles you you can take note of like john and james and all those people and each one had their assignment to do but peter in the very initial days uh, he provided leadership so that is the personality of peter and we also recognize that peter had this um uh, problem of letting go of his tradition so initially he was not open to preaching the gospel to the gentiles but he had a vision in acts 9 and uh, 10 we know that he uh, went god gave him a vision and said you know show, don't uh, uh, disregard any group of people so i'm sending you to the house of cornelius a gentile you go there you preach the gospel so he obeys it he goes and he ministers to the gentile so that's where his ministry um, uh, you know opens up uh, into the gentile community uh, and later on also you know, there is an incident where we observe that peter he followed certain traditions to keep the jews happy and you know he was a uh, uh, he tried to um, like he wouldn't eat with the gentiles and all that again to keep the jews happy so he would do things like that and paul rebukes him and says come on peter you have to have the same stand you can't have double standards so uh, that was you know again peter's attitude but now when we read this uh, epistle it is really interesting to note that he had grown fond of the gentiles he had become obedient to uh, the lord jesus to an extent where he is he his audience is gentile okay so the transformation that god brought about in peter's heart to minister to a group of people that he initially never wanted to minister to so you know that's amazing that uh, first peter second peter he's writing to the gentiles okay so let's uh, start off with uh, uh, this chapter i know that i kind of touched on it uh, in the last class but again you know i just uh, uh, start with verse 1 and uh, explain it in a proper way today all right so we begin with you know his introduction and i told you that uh, people used to write their name in the beginning because then it's easy for the reader to recognize who wrote it so peter an apostle of jesus christ so his calling as well he is clear about his calling even paul you know you would find paul writing this paul an apostle so the knowledge of one's calling uh is it's really helpful when when one knows what they are called to and uh, in these cases 
no paul peter they were quite aware about what god god wanted them to do and then he writes to the pilgrims and i told us that pilgrims means people who are traveling through um and on a journey of devotion okay so even here in our nation we have uh, people who travel you know to certain parts of the country maybe himalayas or you know some other uh, places where they go to worship so when they go there they are pilgrims they don't belong to that place but they've gone to worship and then they will come back okay so to the place where they are they have a home and uh, they are well settled so he addresses the uh, listeners or the readers as pilgrims so what uh, understanding do we have here see basically he recognizes that the people of god have a citizenship in heaven so the earth is not our permanent uh, permanent residence so one should have that attitude you know it's when we end up believing that the earth is everything for us or this world is everything and you know we gather up even jesus said you gather up riches you make homes for yourself you do all these things uh, which is not wrong but if we have a mindset that i'm permanently going to be here and so i have to build my kingdom on the earth then there is a problem but a pilgrim mindset where we think okay i am passing through the journey of life and uh, i have to do what god has called me to do but my ultimate citizenship is in heaven okay so that is why he says pilgrims and i told us that these people were communities of gentiles that were in the asia minor region so what are some of the places where they were it's called uh, pontus galatia cappadocia asia and bithynia so these are the places where uh, the audience lived and uh, they were uh, primarily gentile people uh, and he also uses the term dispersion okay dispersion was a term which was used uh, for the jews at the time because we know that after the destruction of the temple they were the ones who were uh, uh, you know they they had gone uh, and spread across you know many different regions so dispersion was generally a term that was used for them but he is using it for the gentiles now we can also understand that he is recognizing the gentiles as god's people okay uh, and that is why a term which would be used for the jews he is open to using that for the gentiles now coming to verse 2 where he says elect according to the foreknowledge of god the father so this word elect okay what is it elect means chosen so just think about this similar to the book of hebrews the book of peter is also a word of encouragement so encouragement uh, is is brought in the book of hebrews we saw that the revelation of the lord jesus you know he reveals that you have a greater sacrifice you have a greater calling you have a greater temple you know you have a, a greater identity in this god and that's how uh, hebrews puts it similarly peter when he wants to encourage the hearts of the listeners you know he goes to the identity of the believer first and he starts with that he says elect already he said pilgrim so pilgrim also is really encouraging to know that i have citizenship in heaven so no matter what i lose on the earth are my permanent place is up there okay so you see the identity of the believer is very very important and as pastors leaders when we minister to people we have to help them become secure in their identity now if people are secure in their uh, spiritual identity of who they are in christ uh, they can experience many challenges on the earth but you know they will have clarity that all these things are passing but whatever is uh, essential 
for eternity it has already been accomplished for us through jesus christ so they will they will have that confidence and that is why you find peter also going by the identity so again he starts off he says elect or in other words you are chosen and at that time the gentiles would have felt a little left out isn't it because the jews are the ones who were uh, given prominence but look at peter see how his heart has changed he is writing to the gentiles and he is telling them you are chosen you are uh, selected by god and you are very unique to god now elect is a term which you can use for any believer just a gentile but everyone who is a child of god is chosen unique special unto god so that's how he begins and he says according to the foreknowledge of god the father now this this uh, revelation about the foreknowledge what is foreknowledge the foreknowledge is uh, a part of the uh, the identity of god whenever we say okay god and we describe who god is we would generally say he is omniscient omnipresent and uh, omnipotent okay these are the abilities of our god so omniscient means he knows everything he even knows what is going to happen before it happens so that is foreknowledge where god already knows who are the people who are going to follow him so in this case we see that chosen according to the foreknowledge of god is what peter is saying so does it mean that god has a set of people whom he wanted to select to be part of his kingdom the others he said okay you know you don't have to be a part of my kingdom i have already chosen a few does it work like that because he say you are chosen according to god's foreknowledge so the way we should understand this is you look at all the other passages in scripture when you see the lamb of god was slain before the foundation of the earth god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son you know, whosoever believes those are the uh, those are the uh, words that we read in other passages so anyone who believes can receive salvation so we must not understand or interpret this chosen for knowledge as god has already selected the people whom he wants in his kingdom that's not what it means basically the invitation is open to the whole world to accept christ and that is why we have to go you know uh, uh, it says go into all the world and preach the gospel so we have to preach it to every creature now when we preach and give the choice to everybody uh, we see that some people respond okay and the way we will understand foreknowledge is that god already knows who are the people who are going to respond so that's how it works it doesn't mean that god has limited his choice to only a set of people that only those people will understand the gospel only they will come into the kingdom that's not the way we understand because there are many passages in scripture that say this gospel will be preached to everyone or god has uh, given his son as a uh, redemption price for all of mankind so he does not make any uh, distinction or he is not partial okay uh, so this election the way we look at it is that you know it's like choice is given to all but god knows who chooses him okay so that is the way we understand it so for knowledge of god the father in sanctification of the spirit you see here he says you are chosen by who by god the father that al already is so encouraging for us in sanctification of the spirit so you see here the uh, in this verse you see the harmony and the working of the godhead so god the father is mentioned 
sanctification of the spirit so what work does the holy spirit do in the life of a believer there are many many things that the spirit does isn't it we know that he empowers he directs he guides but in this case we see that he also sanctifies or he cleanses okay so no wonder john the baptist he said you will be baptized in the holy spirit and fire because what is fire fire will burn up the chaff or the works of the flesh in us it will be burnt up when we give ourselves to the work of the holy spirit so sanctification of the spirit so that is a work that the holy spirit does in us and then he goes on to for the obedience and sprinkling of the blood of jesus christ so you see here the introduction of the lord jesus as that perfect lamb of sacrifice whose blood is sprinkled okay for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of jesus christ so there are all the three persons of the godhead mentioned here and he says that you know we uh, god has worked on our behalf in this way with everyone you know everyone together okay and uh, we know that yeah the last portion here grace to you and peace be multiplied so that is simply a way of greeting the believers so apparently in their culture their um, greek uh, culture they would greet people with grace you know we say hello or uh, while saying bye sometimes say hey god bless you so it's our way of greeting basically it's their greeting in the greek culture they would say grace no may grace be uh, upon you or grace be given to you so he is blessing the people with that term you know grace and then the christian way of blessing people was okay may you receive god's peace so grace and peace be multiplied to you so it's just a way of greeting the people now he continues he said blessed be the god and father of our lord jesus christ who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of jesus christ so he is reminding them as i've been saying you know the identity which they have he is reminding them that they are already he talked about chosen elect now he is reminding them that they are begotten so what is begotten you know begotten could be understood as being born again so they were given this new life in christ jesus through what through the resurrection of jesus christ from the dead okay so here we are we are the elect and we are uh, the begotten of the lord jesus christ and born into what again so much of hope so much of hope in what peter is saying you know he is saying um, that living hope we have been born into a living hope in other words it is a hope that does not die or it is a hope that does not disappoint okay because there can be many promises out there in the world which could disappoint us but he says that our confidence is so strong that you have a new life through jesus christ and your life is it comes with a warranty you know living hope your hope is alive and god has done this for us and again when we look at you know how good god is to his people we also notice that according to his abundant mercy now if god were not merciful and loving towards us then there is no way for us to have this kind of a life i mean think about it you know if god uh, were the condemning type or if god were the the uh, punishing type now he is a just god but he is also a loving god okay so there is a balance now god is not going to uh, go back on his own character and do something against himself he will never do that so what can god do you know he has to be just 
right? And sin has to be punished. So in order to overcome this sin, what he has done is he has put the punishment on the Lord Jesus and he has extended abundant mercy to his people. That's the way he has established justice, but he has also released love upon his people. And so, you know, we can think about all this. Oh, wow. I have a new life in Christ Jesus. I have been begotten. I am chosen. And my new life is full of hope, you know, living hope that I have. Now, this hope that he's talking about, it's not just a hope for this life, but it's also a hope in the life to come. So, you know, that is the way in which God has blessed us. So we see here, he's referring to inheritance, incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away. You know, whenever someone promises us something, let's think about the, um, uh, you know, some of the things that are sort of um, long term. Okay. Uh, let's say someone promised us a home or a house and they gave us a house. We'll be so happy that, oh, wow, you know, I received this house. And in the long term, hopefully, you know, that house will be uh, of great value and benefit to us. Now, even these things, you know, which are in the long term, uh, on the earth, we can't be sure of anything. You know, what if something happens, something unexpected happens and uh, uh, we no longer have ownership to that house? Okay, so things here on the earth are quite uncertain. So basically he's saying that when we rejoice in uh, the inheritance that we have on the earth, you know, uh, how much more we should rejoice in the inheritance that we have in heaven, which, you know, he adds to that, he says, incorruptible, meaning it is it will remain. You don't have to worry about, uh, you know, some circumstance or uh, some pest or, you know, some some something that happens destroying that inheritance. It will remain for us. And undefiled, okay, undefiled is uh, it will not um, uh, become impure, our inheritance, which we have in Christ Jesus. And it will not fade away okay or the value of that inheritance is not going to become lesser in any way so we have hope not just in this life but even in the life to come as you think about your life ahead you can rejoice oh wow you know god has also given me such an inheritance which nobody can take away from me and then he says it is reserved in heaven for you wow think about it you know that god uh, it's when you say that a chair is reserved, it's waiting for us. So in the same way, he's reminding the believers as it is, you know, God's abundant mercy, uh, living hope, uh, being an elect of God, be, all this itself is so, uh, you know, it brings a lot of joy to us. And to know that we have such a great inheritance, now he adds to it and he says, it's waiting for you. Okay, especially for you, it has been kept aside. And they are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. So at its time, its set time, you are going to walk into these things and experience these things. So there's a lot of encouragement for the believers. Now, what is happening? Why are the believers becoming so discouraged? No persecution, opposition. You see, when we become focused on it, right, the trials in this life, we completely forget the eternal value of this new life that we have and the inheritance that God has for us. And so for us as believers, it's very important. That's why he started by telling them pilgrims, don't be so attached to this world. Okay. And, uh, Focus yourselves on the eternal more than the natural. So that 
again, it's not an invitation for us to uh, be completely absent mentally uh, here in the in the world. No, because we have to be wise. We have to do the work which God has called us to do. We have to make use of the resources and be good stewards of what God has given us. But our perspective must be a heavenly perspective. When we carry a heavenly perspective, it's not easy for the enemy to discourage us. So that is the point. Now, moving on, we are at verse 6. We see here, uh, he says, again, you know, giving them perspective. He says, uh, you greatly rejoice. Though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. So he's saying, uh, right now you are sad because of the challenges that you're going through and look at this you know, he does not deny or he does not rebuke them and say how can you be sad when you're going through difficulties in the world you are a believer you should never be sad he never says that he in fact says you are grieved by various trials so it is possible for us as believers to feel that grief in the difficulties because after all it's natural for us to uh, experience that however he says look if you bear those trials well he says the genuineness of your faith okay that will be seen that will be shown even gold will perish okay? but you see that your faith will remain if you carry an eternal perspective and don't give in to the sadness that you are experiencing because of the difficulties that you are going through. So it's put very beautifully. Let me just read it for you. It's quite self-explanatory. It says, you have been grieved by various trials that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So the difficulties are a, a form of test. Test of what? Of our faith. And when we hold on in faith through those difficulties, you know, it will come forth. He says more precious than gold. So we are, we are all quite uh, familiar that gold, isn't it? Gold is, um, uh, they work with uh, fire to purify it. And, uh, you know, it, when you use fire, extreme fire, gold usually it survives it because it's a precious metal. Okay, so he says that when we go through our trials in the right at with the right attitude and with faith, sometimes even gold might perish. But you know, when this earth is all destroyed, even gold will perish. But our faith will not perish. It is more precious than gold. Okay, so when our faith is tested, we need to carry the right attitude and when our faith remains it will bring praise glory honor and especially when the lord jesus is revealed and he says that having not seen you love so think about this you know peter was a man who walked with jesus when jesus was alive but he is talking to a set of believers who probably never met jesus Okay, it's like about 30, 30 decades after the ascension of Jesus. So he knows that, but he uh, had great honor for the people because they never saw Jesus, but they still loved him. And uh, he, he was blessed by that thought. And he also says, now you don't see him, yet you still believe in him. And you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So, you know, he is happy about the fact that these are believers. Okay. So what is the meaning of believing? You know, so we 
the things we don't see we trust that hey it's true god has done it god is real no jesus is is real so he is encouraged by the believers for the faith that they have in a god whom they have not seen okay so it's a lot of encouragement coming from peter to a, a discouraged set of people now verse 10 he helps them understand that the salvation which they are experiencing um it is very valuable now think about hebrews you know, when we studied about hebrews same thing isn't it he was telling the jews that you're so thrilled about your temple worship and your sacrifices and all that but let me tell you now jesus is the real high priest high priest forever in the real tabernacle now you don't have to offer animals sacrifices because it is um, uh, uh, you know it it's um in it is corruptible the blood of animals it's it's nothing compared to the precious blood of jesus so he makes all these comparisons why does he do that to make the jewish believers understand what you have is way greater than what the people who follow judaism have because it's the real thing now jesus the messiah is the fulfillment of all those jewish practices similarly to the gentile believers you know uh, peter is helping them understand what they have it's so precious he says look salvation you have salvation and you know what this salvation is something that the prophets you know there are so many uh, old testament prophets who uh, prophesied you have messianic prophecies isn't it we talk about it we say mm, i don't know the exact numbers i think somewhere around 400 prophecies or or something where um, people like isaiah they have prophesied uh different things that will happen and you know the the uh, son of god he will be born he will be born of a virgin he will be born in such a place so many things have been spoken about the messiah so they inquired and searched carefully okay, who prophesied about the grace that would come to you so basically he says that they testified of the lord jesus and you know him coming and all that to them it was to them it was revealed that not to themselves but to us they were ministering so in whatever they said what happened is they were actually telling us you know what we are going to see and what we are going to experience through the redeeming work of the lord jesus christ so all these things have been ministered to you they have been spoken to you through the prophets and these are such great things that he also adds and he says that things which angels desire to look into so talking about salvation talking about salvation old testament prophets they prophesied but they could not receive this kind of salvation through jesus themselves okay so how exciting it would have been uh, for them to reveal you know bits and pieces and uh, it would have been really exciting if they could experience what they spoke about but you know that was not to be they spoke it for us and here we are experiencing that salvation and this salvation is so precious that we are told even the angels were wondering what is god going to do how is he going to redeem his people um what are the steps that he will take so god never really shared the plan or the idea with the angels also so even the angels till now they are looking with great awe and delight at the things which are unfolding in the world but here is what we should be happy about as believers and 
that time Gentile believers, he's telling the believers, look, this kind of salvation, which the prophets did not fully understand, the angels want to understand, but they were not told, you have been given that. I have been given that. So, isn't it, you know, precious? Should you not be rejoicing about all these um, uh, supernatural, spiritual things instead of getting sucked up in the difficulties that you are going through? But even if you're going through difficulties, he's just encouraging them and he's saying, look, even gold will perish, but your faith, which is tested by fire, you know, it will remain to the glory of God. So in other words, you know, we say win-win situation, isn't it? Which means, it simply means you don't have any loss. Even if you suffer under trials, God is going to reward you. If you don't suffer, great. You know, who wants to go through difficulties and opposition, persecution? We don't want to. Either way, you are a happy person. You know, you are a blessed person. Uh, you are the chosen person and salvation is given to you. So uh, believers, don't, don't uh, be upset with your struggles. Be encouraged because God has given you abundant mercy. You are such blessed people. Is In other words, if you just want to sum it all up, what he's saying is you are so blessed. I am so blessed. Okay, so remember that. And now moving on to verse 13. So now, you know, he says, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So he is telling them the value of having the right mindset. He says, gird up the loins of your mind. Okay, gird up the loins means those days, you know, people used to wear robes and uh, whenever they were on a journey or traveling, they would fasten the, the robe uh, so that it's easy for them to travel fast. So even today we know that, you know, we do, do that, isn't it? Like suppose I need to... Um, uh, yeah, you know, if I'm wearing something a little flowy or something, if I have to ride a bike, we all know that I uh, here in India, you uh, sometimes you just have these uh, scarves, so you tie yourself up tight like dupatta or whatever, you uh, tie it up nicely and then you hold on to the bike and then you ride because you don't want any disturbance. It's like your preparedness to do a task which is ahead of you. So you're just fastening yourself up or in other words, you know, you're, let's say you're rolling your sleeve. If you have sleeves, if you have really uh, long sleeves, all these are actions that show that I am focusing on the task ahead of me. So in the same way, he's telling them, in your mind, you have to take action. It's like rolling up the sleeves of your mind because now I'm getting serious to do something. So in your mind, don't be uh, slack or don't be careless. You fasten your seat belts, in other words, in your mind. And he says, be sober. Sober means, um, Avoiding extremes. Now, we read in Galatians 5 that the fruit of the Spirit, right? You have a whole list there. There are many things, but it's also self-control, which means that we are not at the extremes of, uh, you know, any, any form of attitude. There is a lot of self-regulation. I'm able to control my behavior, uh, my choices. So he says, for a believer, believer, don't become so overtaken by the problems around you that you have no control you know, over your the way your mind thinks. Oh, God has left me. God has forsaken me. You know, all such thoughts can come. But he's saying, no, you take control of your mind. Be sober. Mean, meaning, you must be able to regulate your thought. Don't go to the extremes. Be self-controlled. And he says, rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Or he's saying in your mind, 
think about salvation think about what jesus has done think about you know the uh, uh, all the things that will unfold for example we talked about inheritance right the reward if you overcome temptation you have a reward so there are so many things that god has promised for us that i can fix my mind on when i do that i will be steady otherwise my mind will wander away so he says it's very important to uh, conquer the mind okay as a child of god and he says as obedient children so basically he says uh, focus and obedience saying yes to god is so important for believers and don't remain the way you used to be because now again he's talking to gentile believers and we know that gentile believers had a completely different way of worship and some of the practices which they had were very ungodly also so that's why he's telling them please don't be like your old selves your old self was um, you know there were lusts within you uh, and uh, there was ignorance you never understood about god but now that one is a believer we can't have that old lifestyle which was filled with lust and with ignorance now both these things should not be part of a life of a believer but what kind of life should one have so he says what god is telling us as believers is be holy even as i am holy so uh, we as believers are being called for a life which is set apart so again you know think about the situation of the uh, gentile believers they were living among others who are observing them and uh, if they did not have a better life or a more moral life compared to what it used to be just think about what the people who watch them would think oh what has changed nothing has changed these people say they believe in god but they continue to live their lives with lust or they uh, live their lives in an unholy way however you know, peter is saying come on so now you are set apart holy means what holy means set apart god has chosen you as his people so the kind of life that now we have to live as believers it has to be one that honors god and that is why god says you know be holy as i am holy so that is the mandate which god has given us so what we'll do class is we'll take a break right now and we will come back we will continue with uh, the remaining portion of uh, first peter 1 and then move into first peter 2 okay so let's go in for a 10 minute break uh, we'll be back at uh, 10 10 am yeah thank you <music> 